Welcome to the Drexel Interview. I'm your host, Paula Morantz Cohen, speaking to you from the Drexel University Picture Gallery. Today, our guest is the author, critic, and journalist Christopher Hitchens. Mr. Hitchens is a contributing editor to Vanity Fair and a visiting professor of liberal studies at the New School in New York City. He is here to discuss his latest book, Hitch 22, a memoir. This is a two part interview. In the first part, we'll be dealing with the more personal aspects of the memoir, and in the second part, the more political aspects, though of course there's bound to be overlap between personal and political. Christopher Hitchens, welcome to the Drexel Interview. Thanks for having me. Um, I say Christopher. Yes, please. Because I know that you prefer to be called Christopher and not Chris, and you mention in your memoir the fact that early in your career at Oxford, um, the Marxists with whom you were involved called you Chris, and the tutors and the more elite faculty at Oxford called you Christopher. And I wonder if your preference uh, doesn't suggest an underlying political loyalty from the very beginning. The loyalty, alas, um, is less complicated than that. It was to my mother and to her social aspirations. She called me Christopher because she thought it was a nice name. She thought to shorten it to Chris, to circumcise it or amputate it was a, <laughs> was a crime. And especially since my second name begins with H, and in England everything depends on the aspirate, mm. and people who drop them are crude. But the next thing that happens if you are called Chris and your name is Hitchens is Chris Hitchens. Ah. And that she would have thought would be unforgivably lower class. Mm. Um, your upbringing was middle class, lower middle class, would you say? I don't know if those gradations. Ah, well, no, no one in England puts themselves in the lower, lower middle class. <laughs> they always want to say lower or maybe upper middle, um, or just middle. My father's family was quite working class. They came from a tough district in the Portsmouth Dockyards where my grandfather rose to be a school teacher in a rather hard school. My father got out of it in, um, by moving into the Navy, going off to sea. Um, he wouldn't have sounded like me at all. Uh, they wouldn't have spoken like this. And my mother's family came from a Jewish um, background in Liverpool. Again, by no means the forcing house of the British bourgeoisie. And both of them had sort of social aspirations, um, my mother particularly. And these were <clears throat> projected, is the word I, I suppose, onto your humble servant because <laughs> I was the firstborn and the, the, the proof that you've moved into the middle class proper in, in England is very simple. The, at least the firstborn son has to go to a private school okay. and then to a university. Okay, um, I wanted... And which none of my family had done before. So I, I was always very acutely aware of the tiniest social nuances. George Orwell says about the English that they're all branded on the tongue from the moment they're born. Hmm. It, it still is amazingly true. So the, the accent? The accent and the avoidance of certain commonplace expressions as well. Mm, interesting. And above all, holding on to the H's. So do you think that this class, this weight of class, on you was part of the reason why you felt liberated and became an American citizen? I guess this happened after 9-11, but nonetheless, do you think you were drawn that, in that direction? Well, I can't early? explain completely why it was that in my teens I began to have this very strong need to, to come to the United States. But there it was. It was as strong as my need to become a writer. Uh, it, was, it wasn't a desire, it was a compulsion. In fact, I now realize they were probably two aspects of the same thing. But no question about it, yes, it was a means of getting out of a society that was uh, rather too stratified, with oneself not stratified, perhaps quite high up enough in the, on the ladder. And yet you managed to rise pretty high. I want to talk about your parents. Uh, first, your father, you already mentioned the fact uh, that he came from a working class background, but he himself was in the British Navy. Mm. You referred to him affectionately and somewhat satirically as the commander. Um, he seems to be a certain sort of British type that you admire and that I feel you feel is a lost breed. And from a lost empire too, which was dying, visibly dying while, while I was growing up. I was being educated in schools that admired and almost were still training you to work for an empire that when you opened the newspaper or turned on the TV, you could see was winding down. Weird feeling. 
And my father, who'd been all around the world on the deck of a Royal Navy warship, policing this empire, and then had had a very tough time in the Second World War, very, very grueling Second World War, was let go by the Navy shortly after the war and felt that everything he'd worked for and everything he'd given his life to had had proved not worthwhile, really, and that, and that he, he wouldn't have put it like this, but I did. He'd been rather taken for granted and rather exploited by the establishment, the monarchy, the empire, to which he'd been so loyal. And that, that had a big influence in moving me to the left, because I thought, you do all this, you do everything right, you're brave, you're thrifty, you're flinty, you're, you're, um, you, you work, as they say here, work hard and play by the rules, and, mm. and they don't treat you right. Your mother, your mother then, and I feel there, the emotion is very intense. Um, Yvonne, a name that, as you note, is not an English name and itself no. says something, um, was a glamorous character, an artistic character in certain respects, yeah. a dramatic character. Um, she uh, died in a suicide pact with her lover, um, who was a manic depressive, a former minister, and you, uh, this was when you were already grown, yes. you were an adult. This must have been uh, devastating for you, and I wonder how it changed your view of the world or of people when this happened. Well, um, the whole axis of the idea of my, my divided self, which is the, the, in a way the point of the book, is the huge contrast between her and my father. Among other things, he was 12 years older than her. And very stoic and continent, as I said, in a matter of few words, but very honest and decent, but frankly, boring. And, well, boring for her. She was bored by him, I could tell. And she would have liked a world of sort of brittle cocktail parties and uh, gay visits to the theater and so forth. And mm -hmm. she never got that you know, as a naval officer's wife, being moved around one grim base to another. Um, and she tried in the millinery business, which was what her mother had been in also, <coughs> to do something for the world of fashion, but it never worked out. She wasn't, mm -hmm. didn't have a very good business head, actually. So I grew up feeling in a different way sorry for, for both of them. Mm -hmm. And in those days, people of that class didn't get divorced. <clears throat> I used to wonder why they didn't, but I knew why. You, you just don't. Mm. It would be a scandal. And as a result, she waited too long. She waited till my brother and I had left home. Um, when she finally broke into me and introduced me to the guy who she desperately wanted me to approve mm. of, I remember saying to myself, It'll, I can stand anything as long as she doesn't say, I waited till you and Peter had, were old enough. And then she did say exactly mm. that. And I thought, what a waste. You know, um, well, the and she left it too late, <coughs> and she was beginning to lose her looks and her. She was very beautiful, I think, felt it very acutely. So and she really chose went, the wrong person. And she chose instead of a stoic, but dull and honest and hardworking and uh, reliable commander Hitchens. She picked a spoiled priest of the Church of England, a guy who could quote the odd poem who probably did like going to the theater and cocktail parties, things like that. Sounds Madame but couldn't, hold, couldn't hold a job, was, a, was what we now yeah. would call a, a flake. And I now realize bipolar as well. Uh -huh. And she didn't need to die or want to die, but she wanted someone who did need to die. And I believe he talked her into a, a pact of suicide when they realized it wasn't going to work out and they weren't going to get another chance with anyone else. So it was... But you can never know the details behind I that. I can't know all of it, no, but I've, I've done a lot of thinking about it, and I'm, I'm fairly sure that's what it was. Well, you do mention that your mother, you found out after her death that she was Jewish. Yes. That was her background. Um, and I think this is, uh, it's interesting you say she was in no sense a Jewish mother, stereotypically, and yet the idea that she uh, wanted to sacrifice, well, she hid her Judaism so that you and your brother could get on strikes me as the epitome of the self-sacrificing Jewish mother taken to an extreme. Have you thought of that? Yeah, self-sacrificing is one thing, but uh, the, the classic um, martyred Jewish mother is not so, so self-effacing about her Jewishness, usually. I think my mother genuinely wanted to pass for her own sake. Mm. For one thing, she didn't, as they say, look Jewish. For, she looked French to me when I was a kid. My father never knew, see, uh, and his family would have minded. Yes, you I'm write that in the book. Sorry to yeah. say, my grandfather would certainly not have wanted a Jewish uh, daughter-in-law. Well, may I and ask you something? Yes. I interrupt you. Um, do you think growing up knowing you were Jewish would have changed you in some essential way? 
Well, the, my only answer, possible answer, thinkable answer to that is I can't believe it wouldn't have. Mm. Because it would have been a major issue. You know, it, so yeah. that boys like Mr. Kissin and Mr. Wertheimer wouldn't have seemed exotic to me. Mm. And I thought, actually, no, we're, we're brothers under the skin. Funny thing is, I went, I did an event with my friend Martin Amos at the Jewish Book Fair in London um, a couple of years ago. And I was doing a book signing afterwards, and I looked, I realized I should look up. There was something happening. And there were three or four of the young guys I'd been at Oxford with, all the Jews, hmm. who'd been there, at, at a time when I hadn't known and they hadn't known. And we'd all found out since, and they knew, they knew that I knew and so forth. And they'd all come, and there they were. And of course, I looked at them in a completely different way. You know, we could have been cracking kind of odd jokes together and doing this and that. Um, yeah, you would have had a different social scene, let's put it uh, that yes, way. Yes, I'm certain I would, yeah. Okay. But uh, actually, if you yeah. join, as I did, the extreme Trotskyist Marxist left, you find that you practically are in a minion. Were you, you were, uh, you did your work in, at Oxford in literature? Was that your No, I should have done. Because you're steeped in literature and you refer to literary works throughout your book. Um, and I'm struck by certain characters of books that you mention, uh, well, Orwell certainly mm. and uh, Waugh. Um, and it strikes me that you identify with Charles Ryder and Brideshead Revisited. Daniel Deronda is mentioned at one point. You studied that book with Edward Said, the Palestinian scholar. Yes. Pe people who don't know Daniel Deronda is George Eliot's great book in which the character discovers uh, he's an English aristocrat or thinks he is. It discovers he's Jewish midway yep. through. Fascinating, wonderful book. Great book. Um, it strikes me also that there's sort of aspects of, of John, Johnsonian, Samuel Johnson friendship in, in your book, there's a sense of the Cambridge spies. There's a sense in which you've modeled yourself or perhaps, um, I don't know whether it's unconsciously, use literary references to present yourself. Are you aware of this? Um, yes. Maybe even Pip in Great Expectations, uh -huh. there's a bit of that there as um, well. Well, I, I hope it isn't, <laughs> I hope it doesn't seem in any sense feigned, but yes, I mean, as soon as I realized that I, thought there was no moral or ethical content to religion, which I discovered quite early. I, I went looking for ethical discussions and uh, confrontations about ideas and principles in, in literature, yeah. and to some extent in history. And Orwell was, was very important because he wrote his social novels I'm talking about, not the anti-totalitarian ones or the essays, but his certain novels like Coming Up for Air, um, keep the Aspidistra flying, a clergyman's daughter. They're not very easy to find, but they're really worth digging out. Um, and I didn't know novels were written about families like ours. Hmm. I didn't think, you mean we can be literary too? <laughs> it was like like um, Moliere's Monsieur Jourdain, who says, he's I didn't realize prose. he's been teaching, <laughs> he's speaking prose all his life. Um, even in War World, who can't be moved by just the comic genius of that? And also the tragic element of it. Mm. The character of Charles Ryder, there are interesting points of correspondence. Well, no one who's been young and at Oxford doesn't have some point of view about Brideshead Revisited. And, and I call it Brideshead Regurgitated in, in the book, <laughs> because there's, there's always the terrible danger of, a, of an attempt to revive it, which would undoubtedly be hammy. But privately, everyone thinks, well, this person is the Sebastian Flight of our time. I can actually remember who we used to think was the Sebastian Flight character. And were you Very, assigned an amazing the role? called, um, <coughs> called uh, and the, also the Anthony Blanche character. Mm -hmm. No, I wasn't, I was by then in, in a very austere uh, leftist milieu where we would have thought that was unpardonably frivolous. We're not going to be doing Brideshead when Vietnam is burning from end to Yet end. You were still so having forth. your dinners with yes. James Asparrow. Off the record. <laughs> <laughs> I was. Yeah. By night, I would uh, uh, don another garb, but um, you know, we wouldn't have gone around giving uh, punting parties with um, peaches and champagne and so forth. Um, it would have been a little too yes, self-indulgent. Yes, we, we, we were supposed yeah. to be giving out leaflets um, in favor of Dr. King and um, against the Vietnam War and um, for the students in solidarity with the students in France and things like that. But you oh. were split, weren't you, mm. between this sense of austerity, of political austerity, you know, leftist solidarity, yes. and this more <coughs> luxurious, more uh, effete 
way of looking at the world. Well, you put it very well, but uh, remember for me, uh, my life experience had been that the, the affectation of austerity was a thing of the right wing, of, mm. the, of the very sort of cal almost Calvinist military, civil service, middle class that I was from, where Interesting. frugality was you know, an ethos. And I mean, I identified it with a very conservative worldview. For me, pushing the boat out a bit with perhaps the odd peaches and cream and, um, and so brandy and champagne was, was, actually, was, actually, was really more like moving to the left. So you could reconcile the peaches and Don't cream Don't you think that's ingenious, by the way? That is so ingenious. Now, I didn't, he got I out think, of that I one think beautifully. Oscar himself could have. Yeah. Well, actually, Wilde did used to say things mm. like that because he was actually a very serious socialist, but, mm. but he certainly had champagne taste. And I think he used to say, you know, languidly sipping from a fruit, nothing's too good for the working class. Uh, <laughs> that sort of thing. Yes. Um, one of the hallmarks of your writing style is a, a quality of being emphatic. Um, you are a bad boy of journalism, as they say. You are an agent provocateur. Um, and yet, I found one of the most uh, interesting and not quite as lucid as your usual writing in your book was the chapter about changing one's mind. Yes. I found that a very fascinating and not Hitchens-like chapter or portion of a chapter where you talk about how mind changing happens gradually. And it seemed to me that you were really speaking about the need or the possibility in you of for ambiguity or tentativeness or uncertainty. Mm. And I wonder if, I mean, I felt this was very uh, genuine what you were writing there, but I wonder if you ever feel that this philosophy and your style are at odds with each other. A little bit, yes. Um... And thank you, by the way, for noticing that, because it's very important to me. I also argue that it's not always a question of your changing your mind. I think very often your mind changes you. You suddenly realize that without having intended to think something, mm. or while intending to, to think something, you can't quite do it anymore. It doesn't mean the same to you as it used to. Yeah. And you wonder why. And you, if you undertake an honest exploration of why that is, it may lead you in some alarming but fruitful directions. That's actually why I called the book Hitch 22 because it's, it's a minor key echo of the great uh, Joe Heller's paradox, but um, in a lifetime that's had quite a lot of commitment in it and allegiance. Um, I've now reached a point where I'm mainly associated with a group of people who I suppose could be described as um, adamant for skepticism or resolved for uncertainty or certain <laughs> only of the principle of uncertainty, so to say. And you know who I'm talking about, Richard Dawkins mm. and others, with whom I'm very, very flatteringly associated. Long may this overpraise continue. Um, and this pits us, of course, against. It's not as soft a position as it might look. It pits us against the people who are completely sure they have all the answers, mm. the modern totalitarians, the ones who have all the information they need and who indeed have the truth because it's been revealed to them. And they're yeah. already qualified to tell us what to do. Um, opposition to that lot is the cause of my life and always has been in a way. Mm. And opposition to all forms of totalitarianism, not just as the system of thought, but in the, in the mind. But do you ever feel that you're expected to be extreme and that sometimes you just would like to be not extreme? Well, I mean, you see both sides, you perhaps see the other side, but you see this side, but that's really not your persona in the media. I don't know about extreme. Of course, it's very, it's very hard for me to guess how I'm, how I'm viewed, but um, I suppose probably not as a centrist, no. But that's different from being an extremist. Anyway, no, I don't, I never take, I know of myself that I don't, I never take a position for effect. I don't do that. Well, I want to talk about your friendships. You, you mm. know, this has been, I guess you've been asked this question too many times about your male friendships. Um, uh, your friendship with Martin Amos, whom you seem to adore, the mm. son of the great and inimitable Kingsley Amos, whom you also knew yes. and liked, um, at least before the end of his life. And then uh, James Fenton, the poet. Others, uh, you mentioned you had a Friday when you were in London, you used to have a Friday meeting of these people and sort of imitate the Algonquin round table. Um, no, not consciously. Not consciously? No. I thought some of, the, no. some of the limericks and some of the, some of the witticisms sounded to me a little bit as though you were very consciously involved in trying to be, do... Uh... Look, 
Dorothy one Parker. Can't, one can't, <laughs> one can't, one can't um, be unaware of the existence of things like that. Mm. Uh, but w where we were meeting was actually in Bloomsbury. Mm. So the thing we had to particularly pretend not to be emulating I see. was the Bloomsbury. <laughs> And so I, really don't think, I really don't think we were much like them. No, I don't no. think so either. I think Actually, at the time, we didn't, it didn't seem like a set at all. It does now. And it's been enshrined now in lots of books and memoirs, and it's become quasi-legendary. Um, but then it, would, it really was a pretty much informal Friday lunch get-together that would often go on mm -hmm. until it got dark. And now you still have periodic meetings of some of those people in New York. Is yeah, right? or, yeah. Or, or London or anywhere where we can meet. Okay. Now, the point there, though, is that there are so few women in that circle. And, um, you know, I guess... None, it, to be exact. None. That and line. in academic parlance, we would call this a, 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 an expression of homosocial bonding to the nth degree. Sounds all right. Um, I wonder, what do, you, what do you make of that? It's peculiar. As a woman looking at it, yes. I would have liked to be part, but I realize I would have no role. There was no prohibition. It wasn't an all-male club. Sometimes w women, I remember Julie Kavanagh came. I think Tina Brown may have come mm. a couple of times as well. But none of them really wanted to come regularly. Without anything being said, it was a male bonding uh, You event. think it was, the, it was the kind of humor, the kind of talk that was involved that was of a certain sort of... No. If you mean the rude limericks and so yes. forth. No, because women are very good at that. I also find it fantastically funny. Not and the also, women also I know. Very, also very often men, men, try, <laughs> men try much harder if there are women there. Oh, that's very good. often, the, the, the real vice I find of closed male clubs and similar societies is that <clears throat> they're almost certain to degenerate into tedium because without the, the spur of womanhood, a lot of people don't perform very well. So how come this did work without women? Uh, well, so in the evenings, say, I mean, there was uh, Julian, uh, if we all met at Kingsley's house, there would be girls. Um, Tamas and Day Lewis, I remember. Um, Do you the, think the sister are, of, are there ways uh, in Pat, which women? Pat Kavner, the great literary agent, who was. A, you know, but as you uh, said yourself, Mrs. Mrs. Julian Barnes. Um, they, uh, they were not usually there, and they were sort of on the periphery. Not so, at this squalid kebab house. So, so what? What is the? What is the appeal? What is the? nature of this all-male camaraderie, I mean, that it, it wasn't just happenstance. It, it was not much more than that. Again, if, if we'd sat down and said, this is, this is a boy's lunch, no. Mm. That, that would have been, there'd be something, <clears throat> uh, something doomed about that, I feel. It, ju it just happened to be that way. You don't think there and is? There are, and there are, there are there are forms of friendship that can only occur between men. Okay, well, that's the question. Yeah. What, what is that? Uh, what, can you explain a little more? If I ask myself, say, with Martin, who's my most adored friend, you, every, every man should have somebody who knows his whole story. I mean, who, without being told, or having to be told next time they meet, I mean, he, he knows your backstory. He, he's been through it all with you, hashed it over the next day, perhaps, um, been there when it was whatever it was was happening. Um, don't need to speak of it. You know, it's it's just a whole layer there. You can't. It's very hard to have that kind of of pl platonic, shall we say, friendship with a female. Hmm. It just is. I, I think have the I have the impression that for women that's more or less the same. That it, their confidants don't tend to be men. Uh, well, I'll have to think about that. But uh, I think it's different. Or. <clears throat> yeah. Not always, um, this wouldn't always work out, or not always, but not heterosexual men. Okay. A lot of women have gay male confidence. Okay. A lot of my female friends do that. But it, it, it would tend to be another girl who knew all your interests. Okay, now the, di the distinction you draw between <coughs> the, you know, heterosexual and the homosexual, you, did, you do describe in your book a number of homosexual experiences mm -hmm. that you've had throughout your life, and yet you hold strongly to the line that you are heterosexual. And I wonder about that, um, whether you, why you feel the need to have that category even. No, um, I hold strongly to the line, which is really my reason for putting it in the book, because mm -hmm. I did wonder whether I wanted to or should was uh, noted, the whole, the whole is, is to point out that mo in, in almost every heterosexual man I've ever met, there's quite a lot of the gay. And I thought it might be worth saying this and reminding people of it at a time when homosexuality is 
still being attacked as a, an illness or a crime or disorder, that if more heterosexual men would admit that they knew more about it than they let on. Okay. Um, you have a very moving section at the end of your book um, about your children. Um, and you speak it's as much regret, I think, as expression of love um, in terms of what perhaps you hadn't done or yes. might have done as a father. Uh, what kind of reaction did they have to that? I found, it, I found it one of the most moving sections of the book. I don't know, and I wonder if I'll ever find out. Have you asked them? No, certainly not. Why not? Um, well, it would be too much of a leading question. Hey, have you got to the bit about you yet? I wouldn't, be, I wouldn't do that. I made sure they all saw it early on but I haven't had any feedback. I had, actually, my children don't tend to read my stuff. Oh, mine don't either. <laughs> but that's the reason why you ought to discuss yeah. it with them, so they don't miss it. It's there for them to come across one mm -hmm. day. I, I don't need them to read it now, but I wanted to get it down. They might read it after I'm gone. That's true. Anyway, we're out of time for this section, oh, unfortunately. Um, but we'll be back, and I want to thank you, Christopher Hitchens, for this interview. Thank you so far. And thank you for joining us today at the Drexel Interview. Hello and welcome to the Drexel Interview. I'm your host, Paula Morantz Cohen, speaking to you from the Drexel University Picture Gallery. This is the second part of a two-part interview with author and journalist Christopher Hitchens. Mr. Hitchens is a contributing editor to Vanity Fair and a visiting professor of liberal studies at the New School in New York City. We are talking about his latest book, Hitch 22, a memoir. In the first part of our interview, we discussed the more personal aspects of his life as recorded in his book. In this part, we'll discuss the more political aspects, though as I've noted, it may be hard to keep these two separate. Christopher Hitchens, welcome back to the Drexel Interview. Nice, nice to be back. Um, you note uh, that when you were at Oxford, your friend uh, James Fenton said that you were the second most famous mm. individual at Oxford at the time. Strangely this, wounding remark. You yes. were annoyed by this, of mm. course, but it seems to me somewhat complimentary. What were you second famous for? Second famous for? Oh, it would have been um, rushing onto the pitch to disrupt a South African team at a cricket match, for example. Okay. Or shutting down a debate, which I'm now rather embarrassed at having done at the Oxford Union, our famous, world famous debating society, because of the foreign secretary's arrival to defend the invasion of Cambodia. Things like that was what I was well known These were high profile political. That and, of, that and of course, sexual charisma and <laughs> brides had regurgitated. And so, <laughs> that but, too. Yeah, that, so yeah, that's, and those two aspects, yeah. yeah you've had, you would have had a reasonable chance of knowing who I was, I think, yes. Well, that's quite, that's quite something to be, uh, have such a high profile. Now, did you work at that? Yes, but it's a terrible thing, you know, because one, learns, one had learned at school that the, the boys who were good at everything and became head boy and so forth was, uh, were famous. They were ones you were never going to hear from again. <laughs> Yeah, but once you're at Oxford, it may be different. Flash in the pan, possibly. Yeah. Um, you are, and you say you were, a product of the 1960s, yeah. um, very much so, um, and particularly the events of 1968. Um, do you still think of yourself as of that time as a 68 heures, as you say at one point? Well, I think of, I prefer that to being thought of as just a 60s person. I mean, mm. the 60s person is someone like Bill Clinton, 
who, who was at Oxford with me in point of fact, uh, yeah. just another greedy narcissist <laughs> who thinks that you qualify by a lot of uh, sex and dope, um, essentially. I mean, I thought... That's what no. you thought? Did you think right? And by all you have to do to qualify there is to have been born in a certain year. Uh -huh. you might, as well, might as well call yourself a boomer and have done with it. A soison vital means someone who took part mentally as well as physically in what was the last uh, gasp, as I now realize it was, of the socialist revolutionary movement in Western Europe and Eastern Europe too, um, and, and of course elsewhere, but, and for whom re battles over the writings of Rosa Luxemburg, Leon Trotsky, C.L.R. James, Victor Serge, and so on, George Orwell, were real things and unbelievably tangible, meant much more to us than, than, than the studies we were supposed to be undertaking. Yes, I, I, would, I would own to that, I'd own up to that, and I'd say that some of what it taught me, and certainly how to conduct an argument dialectically, was worth having and stays with me. So even if the ideas have changed, the, the form is still there. Yes, and then one more thing, I suppose, not to sound, because I know that <clears throat> my students find nothing more boring than reminiscences of old 60s uh, <laughs> radicals, but and I can understand why, since we've left them not much except political correctness and safe sex, two kind of parodic uh, <laughs> malformations of the thing. Um, but to have had the experience of really thinking, waking up in the morning and thinking, there is a world revolutionary up, uprising going on. The, you can see it on the faces of the college establishment and on the faces of the political establishment and the policemen. They don't know what's, going, what's gone wrong. They've lost their sense that they're in charge. Um, every piece of news was more revolutionary and amazing than the, than the last. American cities burst into flames because it's enough already with the treatment of black America. Um, assassinations of leading politicians. A unbelievable, unconquerable resistance of the Vietnamese people. Um, <clears throat> next, you wake to find that Charles de Gaulle has had to flee Paris in a helicopter to go and talk to his generals because he doesn't control Paris anymore. It was Paris, is in, yeah, Paris is in the hands of the Parisians. <clears throat> the sense of possibility. Uh, and then the extraordinary developments in Czechoslovakia, which portend, which on this we were absolutely right, by the way, portend for a short thing the end of the Russian uh, Empire in, the, in Europe anyway. And, and of the Cold War. So this was, you really felt you were playing a part in history and obviously little of that was being too young and too cocky. But it wasn't, it wasn't completely bogus and I, I'm, I'm sort of sorry for uh, someone who's never had a moment like that. It doesn't come along every generation. Well, I want to then, you did mention Bill Clinton and you yes. dis make a distinction between your own activism, uh, your own form of 60s uh, involvement and his, and you do seem to have a, well, you do have an abiding disdain, if not hatred, for him. Did this begin? Contempt. 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 Yes. Uh, different then from your feeling about Henry Kissinger. That's hatred and the other's contempt, or are they on the same level? Oh, uh, well, I've got room to, uh, plenty of both, actually. For, for both. For, for Mr. Kissinger, plenty of both. For Clinton, it would, hatred would be sort of the wasted on him. Uh -huh. He's a contemptible figure. And did you feel that going way back to the time when no, you knew no, him? No, I hardly, I hardly yeah. knew him. Um, and he, was a, he would have been a little bit older than me anyway. He is older than me, and he came as a Rhodes Scholar. He'd already been to university. I was an undergraduate. Mm. But I did know, and I write um, about the wonderful American Rhodes Scholars who were there with me, um, and the great courage and thoughtfulness they showed, because they were supposed to be having the time of their lives being representatives of their country and their state in Oxford, and that was the whole tradition, and there they were representing a country that they thought was fighting an illegal and immoral war and double-dealing its uh, responsibilities on civil rights. So they would, when we would come out, I, I actually put this, I think, into the mouth of James Fenton, who pointed it out to me. When we'd come out of the dining hall at the end of dinner and into, onto the grass and have a smoke and a cocktail and a chat and a flirt and so forth, they, there would be a circle of Americans over under the elm tree, just one side. And we all knew they had a much more serious conversation they had to have, which effectively was this. Am I going to go to jail? Am I going to go to Sweden or Canada? Or am I going to go to Vietnam? Yeah. Um, there, at that age, had a sh and people would say that they, all they were afraid of was being drafted. 
That's an absolutely disgusting lie. I remember how brave they were and how principled they were, except for Clinton, who we know now was a shameless egomaniac draft dodger who managed to discredit the anti-war movement mm. by his lying. That, in case you wondered, of, yeah. of the many things I can't stand him for, it's, it, it's because of people like him, shabby characters like him, that the, the moral credit of the anti-war movement was diminished in so many people's minds. Now, your, your view of Clinton and the fact that you testified against him Offered um, to do so, yeah. Well, you offered it. It was not, uh, didn't happen. But no. yeah, uh, but this was the beginning of your receiving certain sorts of responses from the left or from uh, friends, so-called friends, who felt that you were a turncoat that then I guess, accelerated. Yes, yeah. Would you say that was the first point where you really deviated yes. from the expected line? Uh, yeah. And how sorry, did you that's a rather casual. Reply. Yes, I think. <laughs> I dare say you're right. And How did that feel? And did you realize there would be more of it and that this was something that at first was dis difficult to take? Well, there's something I've known ever since yeah. I was on the left in the first place and on, in, on the ideological hard left, and that, which is that, and what actually everybody knows in some part of their being, but I knew from experience, you can't be just a little bit heretical. Mm. If you start reconsidering your relationship with, shall we say, the liberal wing of the Democratic Party, you'll find more and more things coming to your attention. You can't disagree with them on just one thing. And since they'd all decided that rallying to the defense of this oaf <laughs> and liar and bully um, was a matter of principle, I mean, it really seemed to matter to them that he be acquitted on charges where he was obviously guilty, um, be allowed to bully women witnesses and perjure himself. And, you know, this squalid, disbarred lawyer as he now is was their, their cultural hero. I thought, well, this means I really am out of here. Does it bother you, though, that when you make... The book I wrote against him was published by Marxist Publishing House. Mm, okay. It was the last thing I consciously did for the left, was to say, if the left thinks Clinton is kosher, then it's making a terrible mistake. But it turned out they did think he was kosher, so uh, that meant a sort of logical conclusion for me. Well, then I'm not really in this galere anymore. But what if, do you feel that as soon as you're not part of that galere, as you say, you become shunted to the other? Galea. No, there's no need for that. But you, I just noticed in the Times on Sunday, you're there at a gr group of neoconservative elite, as it was uh, described in the caption. And I wondered how you feel about now being labeled as part of the neoconservative elite, almost by default. It, it, this is a party given in Washington for someone, I try not to have heroes or heroines. Mm -hmm. And I always tell other people not to. Even when people say they're fans of mine, I say, don't be a fan. But I do regard Ayan Hershey Ali as personally heroic. And I, I'm lost in admiration for her. And anyone who has a party in her honor or for her book, I'll, I'll go to that party, all right. I that, that the left has abandoned her yeah. is the question, surely, here. That the left has, uh, seeing the, the, the image and the, the reality, the personality of her, the most important public intellectual probably ever to come out of Africa, with an extraordinary experience, life experience to tell, and a warning to deliver about theocracy in all its forms, is considered to be somehow un untouchable by the left. That's what the problem is. It's nothing to do with me. Okay. But, but it, it also, it seems to me, it's, an, it's another proof of how culturally and politically reactionary the left has become. Mm. And the media, of course, immediately labels you in the other camp. Well, I'm so tired of that. I yeah. mean, I, I, I could go on if you like, but I mean... No, don't. Well, that sort of thing just <laughs> fatigues me, yeah. Um, you, uh, you sort of ridicule the 60s dictum, the personal is political. Yes. But I wonder, re reading your book, I, I'm struck by how the political for you is personal. And by that I mean <laughs> that as soon as you have a really a personal involvement with somebody, it can very strongly effect, and I think this is normal, but I mean, you're particularly honest about it, it seems to me. It affects how you think, and, and the most dramatic example I can think of is your relationship with Mrs. Thatcher. And uh, I am struck by how having made a remark in the, probably that was meant to be just provocative and satirical, that she was sexy, you yeah. wrote this. Her reaction to it, which was so game and so delightful, that I do think, and uh, that you consciously or unconsciously, became more drawn, <laughs> if not to her politics, than to anything that she might support. I wonder if you could address that. Maybe you want to go over that little I think anecdote. you may have just sold a few books in the last moment, though. 
<laughs> you, you will want to know. Let's what, not was tell this, them so that they buy what, the book. Was this yeah. sexual encounter Christopher yeah. had with Margaret Thatcher? Maybe we shouldn't. It actually takes too long. But I did think she had a, a charisma that was not gender neutral. I mean, how could charisma be gender neutral, <laughs> frankly? Um, and I was ridiculed for saying so, but I don't think anyone would ridicule it now. I mean, the, all the evidence, the whole evidence is that I was completely right. Mm. She wasn't a shrill, narrow-minded suburban housewife at all. She was a woman of amazing character, and by the way, very beautiful skin and astonishing eyes once you got up close. Um, <laughs> you really I'm are surprised we, I'm surprised we held it to the little contact, that, physical contact that we had. Um, but would and, you... Would you but, but, but no, above all, that she was a conviction person. Um, uh -huh. And I, this was at a time when the Labour Party, of which I was a rather... Uh, shamefaced member uh, was in power in Britain and running a really, really mediocre, compromising, um, drifting regime. And there was a Tory leader, a woman with that, who really wanted to change the society and, and jerk everyone out of their torpor. And there were a lot of things I didn't agree with her about. I thought, well, we can't go on like this with a, with a mediocre, corrupt mm. um, Labour Liberal Alliance. And if, if change is going to come, if the left can't bring it off, then historically it means the right will take their chance. And then on, on one particular thing that I describe, I would have been on her side as a leftist anyway. Again, the left on the whole failed this test. But when the Argentine fascist uh, dictatorship grabbed British islands in the South Atlantic, the Falklands, Malvinas, um, I'd been in Buenos Aires not long before, quite a long time. It was a life-changing experience for me and seen this death squad regime and interviewed its terrible uh, Nazi leader and seen the pogroms it was mounting against the Jewish community. In it was absolutely amazing for me. And I thought, well, if Mrs. Thatcher wants to fight these people, I absolutely agree. And I hope we kick them out of the Falklands. We kick them out of power altogether. Mm. I couldn't see how anyone with any decent claim to a radical conscience could think any other way. But of course, you had been in Argentina, as you say yourself, and you also knew. Yeah, but people knew. knew. You didn't have to go to know. But I wonder, I mean, again, with Iraq, you, you of course, again, truly annoyed the left by your support of the Iraq war. Not all the left. And remember, um, the, remember, it's the right wing that's opposed to the, to the I mean, you, if you only count demonstrators, which mm. is what a lot of people, I'm afraid, do, um, it looks different. But the opposition to the war in Iraq came from the American conservative political establishment, in particular the group around Henry Kissinger, Scowcroft, Eagleburger, flat out against. Then the Pat Buchanan type isolationist right, very, very militantly against. Then Jacques Chirac, probably the most conservative politician in Western Europe at the time, and certainly the most corrupt. Um, the Pope, almost every church, almost every religious organization. But in the States, uh, they we think opposed. of Paul Wolfowitz and that group as being the neoconservative. Well, if you, that's, what, that's the way people have to have it, mm. because other, if, otherwise they'd have to think it out for themselves more. I don't mean to reproach you when I say that, mm -hmm. but yes, if, if, if they absolutely cling to this model, but it doesn't hold up at any point. And it omits two things, both of which I know something about and I'll go on about in the book. One yeah. is the position of, of the Iraqi left, in particular um, the Iraqi trade union and socialist and communist movement and the Kurds of the Northeast, historically a very red and radical population leadership, all of whom were absolutely in favor of the overthrow of Saddam Hussein and worked with the United States and Britain to bring it about. And then a group of us, which I identify in the book one by one, I think quite an interesting little group of socialists and liberals for regime change in Washington. And we actually had what I think were some very good arguments. No one knows what they were because it's all drowned in this chorus of mm -hmm. you no know, blood for oil or whatever right. was the nonsense of the week. And so I, I've maybe at too great length I've explained why it would be that someone of radical temper like myself or Peter Galbraith or Rolf Akias, the great Swedish socialist who ran the UN inspections, uh, all came to the same conclusion. We can't, we can't, can't any longer coexist with the Saddam Hussein regime. So I guess uh, what you are saying then that you're still a leftist. You, you've been able to well, save that for the left, and even your, I, your I attack to, on I, Clinton. Let's put it like this. I know how to argue with someone on the left mm. as if to make them feel that their own principles are being challenged. Their own, their own claim to being a, a socialist is under attack. Yeah, I know how to do that. Um, I, what I wouldn't any longer do would be go around trying to persuade someone else to be a socialist, because 
I don't have the conviction for that anymore, I'm afraid. I don't think there really is a socialist movement or a socialist alternative any longer. While there was, I did my best for it. Um, I still think like a Marxist quite a lot of the time. I mean, I'm, when, I, when I look at history or society, I'm, I'm using... The model. Yes, sure. But you don't call yourself a Marxist. I would, if someone said, was I, I wouldn't say no. I wouldn't want to hear myself deny it. Huh. And you don't have to be a socialist to be a Marxist. I mean, Marxism is a, is a supposedly objective theory of history and the laws of motion of political economy and so forth. It's actually quite persuasive. I mean, if you look, if you look at, as a Marxist at the recent developments in the American economy and the stock market and the nationalization of industry and the, um, the falling rate of profit and the um, fight between finance and industrial capital, it, it's amazing. I mean, this is the, exactly the kind of thing that he was always so good at analyzing. Of course, with any model, it's often possible to find ways in which events can be made to fit the model. True, but in the, in the crisis of American capitalism of the last couple of years, a, a, a lot of people who hadn't thought about this before began to think, well, maybe this guy Marx was onto something. I mean, there, there, are permanent, there are permanent features of capitalism that are pretty much irreconcilably um, in crisis. Uh, they, they, these can be bought off and postponed, but they are, they are built into the system. I think he was right to say so. So perhaps I can call you a Marxist-influenced, non-ideological thinker. Is that to your liking? Well, I suppose I would have to say non-ideological in that mainly one, one is opposed now to the, the totalitarian, the people who say they, they have an ideology that is the answer to everything. You know, I'm, I'm hostile. Do you that. feel as, you're, as an atheist, and I now want to talk mm. a little bit about your views, uh, you are the author of the book God is Not Great. You said in the book that it had, was one word too long. Yes. No, there's a, <laughs> so, my, my dear friend, Salman Rushdie, about whom yeah. I also have a chapter, where, again, it's a great, I like to think it's a great instance of friendship for its own sake, but also friendship as solidarity and what, a very important cause. Mm -hmm. No, he said, good title, but just one word too long. No great there, in no other great. words. Yeah. yeah. So um, it, do you feel, though, in your adamance against God, you're taking a kind of ideological view. It is, you're so absolute there and so not open to other possibilities, or some might, might say that you're, you're being a little bit rigid and dogmatic. No, just I think it's a settled conviction with me that there's no supernatural dimension and no divine authority. And uh, I say, why do I say it's so settled? Because it could be true, but the priests who claim that they know it's true couldn't possibly know it. Yeah. I grant that it could be true. I can't, show, I can't demonstrate that it isn't, but I can tell you that I don't know of any other primate or mammal who has better information than I on, on the basis of which they can say, actually, it is true. Yeah. So <clears throat> I think that settles it pretty, pretty uh, clearly right there. Have you, is this the subject on which you've gotten a great deal of hate mail? Or? No, very much to the contrary. I, would, yeah. I wouldn't have been surprised if I had had mm. some or a lot, um, and I continue to get, I've always had for this subject a bit, Sometimes, as when I was working with Salman when he was still undercover, sometimes very nasty stuff would be delivered to me um, that I had to take seriously. But usually it's just nasty. Um, but no, overwhelmingly, I mean, I, I don't keep and print out my emails and my, my mail, and I, I rather distrust people who sort of use their post bag uh, for reinforcement. But I, if I did, I, you'll have to trust me. You'd be amazed, the number of people who wrote, so I feel so much better. Um, I'm, I don't, I'm out of this now. I don't think I converted them, so to say. I'm sure in a lot of cases, they already had doubts and reservations, but, and I've been invited by, I must say to their credit, a lot of Christian groups, largely Christian, some Jewish, uh -huh. um, to their colleges and institutions to, to debate their students. And mm -hmm. I must say, I think that's very handsome. You are, as you said, a, uh, you know, you, you write a, a lot and you call it a compulsion. I wonder if you think of it, I mean, you are also known to drink. Um, I don't know, and you, perhaps that's a compulsion too. Whether you feel that there is something pathological in the writing process that you're seeking to fill perhaps an unfillable hole or gap in your mm -hmm. being 
Um, has, have you psychoanalyzed yourself in that regard at all? George Orwell says that agreeing to write a book is like volunteering to contract a disease for a limited period of time. And then when you're cured, you go and contract it all over again. <laughs> and I sometimes do, you get the premonitory pangs of thinking, I haven't started this book yet, but I must. Um, but look, every, any profession has moments of that sort. Uh, they just, maybe they're, they're in other professions, it's, you, there are more people you can share it with. There's no one you can really turn to in mind. It's solitary. It, yeah, it has to be. Um, but if I were to say, you know, what else would you do rather than write? There's nothing I could do. I mean, it was, it was resolved for me by, first by the realization that it wasn't what I wanted to do, it was what I had to do. It was my vocation might sound pompous, but I, I know why that word exists. Yeah. Um, and then there wasn't, to be frank, very much else I could do. I, mean, I couldn't have been a lawyer. I certainly couldn't have been a doctor or anything like that. Well, you could have been a lawyer. You're no, certainly good with words. No, I somehow, I couldn't, I can't picture it. Well, I, I, I want to an, end by asking you about this Proust questionnaire that you mm. have at the end of your book, which you say at Vanity Fair, um, you give this to people to get a sense of them. I'm not quite sure why it's called the Proust questionnaire. Oh, uh, you, uh, well, people think, I think, that it's a, a, a word, a, a set of questions put by Marcel Proust. In fact, it's not, um, and it doesn't occur anywhere in his, in his uh, recherche. It's, um, he liked, it's a result of the fact that he liked to play these games, which were quite common in French young people's uh, magazines when he was growing up. Um, he, he liked filling out the answers, and we have two or three of his answers. And, and so we've, Vanity Fair distills. I see. Um, they're almost always the same question. Um, what do you most dislike about your appearance? Um, when and where were you most happy? What do you think is the lowest depth of misery? The best answer, by the way, given to um, the what, what do you most dislike about your appearance question but to Vanity Fair was by Salman Rushdie when he was still in hiding. And he said, what do I most dislike about my appearance? It's in frequency. <laughs> <laughs> that is That's the best answer yet. Yes. Well, you, you, you give the answer. I've, I was struck by your answer to the most, your most marked characteristic, and you said insecurity. Yeah. I don't think most people would necessarily see that, although perhaps after reading the book they'll think otherwise. Um, do you want to elaborate a little bit? Well, it's part of the Hitch 22. If you, if, if you consider yourself to be reasonably knowledgeable, say, and to a, to a, a certain degree educated, what you will keep finding out is how little you know. If you're educated at all, <coughs> you'll have to get more and more impressed by how uneducated you are. <laughs> if you know anything about anything, the, 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 the rate at which our ignorance is expanding, we, we know a lot more, but we know a lot more about a lot more and a lot less about a lot more that we're beginning to discover. So that's why one has to be a skeptic, that's why one has to avoid contamination with any ideology that is full of confidence and certainty and faith. So that's, that's a death trap. Well, thank you, Chris. So it's important to be insecure. I want to thank you very much for being with us oh, today. Oh, it's been a delight. It's been, it's been fascinating. Thanks for having me. And thank you for joining us today at the Drexel Interview. Thank you.